Our final piece of the program today on the main stage is a uh, proof of privacy, uh, proof of human rights panel with a privacy focus, which is going to be led by Mikola Susku of Web3 Privacy. And joining him will be Jameson Lopp, Mr. Lopp, Jameson Lopp, and uh, Jared Hope will be joining him, and the third person was Matthias Tarsius from, from Riyadh. Um, Mikola? Uh, welcome. Welcome on stage, please. Guests uh, we'll have in a moment. Yes, yeah, so our panel will be dedicated to privacy and human rights. Uh, we have a wonderful guest that could really elaborate uh, the complexity beyond both subjects. And I guess that um, our goal today is not just to repeat each other, um, but to expand narration within the privacy and not fall into a trap of privacy is normal. That's kind of banal saying. And I, what I was thinking that many people keep asking, like, since when you are in Bitcoin, since when you are in, in crypto, but I think that no, no one is asking, like, since where you're into anti-surveillance. Like, when was, because with Jameson, there are many things written on how surveillance kind of tapped into his life. Um, I think you also mentioned a lot about American politics and importance of them. But I would ask you kind of to elaborate uh, on privacy, but from another perspective. When the surveillance knocked on your, or your personal door and you thought that, okay, now I need to do something. Let's start with you, you my just, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. I think it's different for a lot of people because I think if you're raised in a Western country where there is like democratic values um, and not in a country where there is like oppression, you might um, not think about that at a super early age. So I would say for me, this was definitely, I mean, I was thinking a lot after reading the cypherpunk mailing list in the 90s being around 14, 15 or so. And I was a lot influenced by, by people around me that um, also f were maybe a bit, par a bit paranoid. <laughs> so I think like for me, this started pretty early. So I would say mid 90s to um, 1995 so or so. And um, especially because, um, I mean, back in the days, like, like also before that being a gamer, uh, like people always feared that um, um, this is, you know, you're doing something illegal, you might be tracked or something, so this, uh, as kids do, <laughs> I think that's, that's how I got into, that's when I got thinking about privacy issues. Although, like, all things considered, looking at today, the situation today, it was, was not a lot of surveillance happening, at least in James, my context. Jameson? Right, so, um, I was well aware and focused on corporate surveillance because I was on the other side of the privacy spectrum. For the first decade of my career, I worked uh, as an engineer for an internet marketing company, and it was my job to actually take the petabytes of raw analytics data that we collected and to uh, you know, help people analyze it in order for marketers basically to better target you know, selling stuff to people. So I was well aware of just how much data was being collected you know, on a day-to-day -day basis as you go about doing your regular activities on the internet. Uh, so I had mostly been focused on you know, running ad blockers and, uh, and VPNs just to, to keep as much of that data from getting hoovered up and, and resold, but it, it wasn't until I got into Bitcoin that I learned about cypherpunk history started going down that rabbit hole, and then it wasn't until I had a SWAT team show up at my house um, <laughs> after a few years that I really started thinking about the physical ramifications of privacy, and then started having to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, how do I protect my, my physical location? And that uh, turned out to be by far the most difficult thing to do. Mm. Jared? Um. I mean, there's multiple different threads, so I, I guess like the earliest I could probably trace that is just having like a strong anti-authoritarian streak when I was a child, especially towards authority figures that I viewed as incompetent um, mm -hmm. or wrongly applying their authority. 
Um, I got into like the cypherpunk scene through like piracy at like flea markets or swap meets on the weekend. They got me into BBSs, and that's where I started um, getting into the scene from there. Um, but I, I think, uh, like James and I, also worked in like uh, performance marketing, and like um, uh, we used to work with data brokers such as Blue Kai, uh, and they were very proud of showing how they could use anonymized data and de-anonymize your profile. And like they were doing this directly in front of me and it was, I was mortified. Uh, but when I decided to become like fully active was through the 2008 financial crisis uh, and Occupy Wall Street. And I was like, okay, this is something that I wanna spend my time on. It's interesting because I, I also worked in the advertising industry that <clears throat> kind of sells itself as the new cool place for young kids to perform shine. They had uh, lots of hipster things around, like cool offices, cool colleagues. Um, and then many people even don't even think about sort of like the conscious decisions about scrapping data, let's say, and using uh, this data. But then linking it to Matthias' talk on values, what kind of values that you manifest within your change, your anti-surveillance uh, personal choices, you would like to pass to people sort of like who are just starting the journey, when, whenever it's a cypherpunk or privacy or like just anti-surveillance in general? I would say it was particularly challenging for me, especially once I really decided to go fully committed to privacy. Because, and I also get some flack for this, is some people say, you're not a real cypherpunk, you're not a real <laughs> privacy advocate because mm -hmm. you're still out here with yeah. your face and yeah. your real name. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yes, uh, unfortunately, if I had done things the right way, I never would have revealed my face and my name, but I had to make a decision, do I go completely underground and really go full privacy and you know, never communicate with anyone using my real identity again? Or do I try to retain my reputation and continue using that to do what a cypherpunk does, which is to advocate mm. for the use and proliferation of strong privacy tools? So from my perspective, I ended up taking a more difficult path because I'm still I'm trying to be private while exposing myself on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean, I think to that point, um, like what Jameson's doing and what we're all doing is trying to increase the anonymity set, right? The more people we get using these protocols, then like the more people can be secured by them. Um, and if people like Jameson aren't advocating for these, like uh, it won't happen, right? People will not get exposed to these ideas or values in the first place. But then the question is like, uh, he was linking that scalability or technological proficiency is not enough. We need to embed certain values. So when people discovering those tools, they will understand like, like, what's the deal there? Especially if UI, UX is sort of so-so, or uh, latency is slow, and stuff like that. Uh, maybe you can share stories like that happened in your life when you advocated and converted people into privacy users through certain narr narratives that were simplified, maybe not that scary or paranoid, uh, in sort of like how you connect with, with people. It really worked beyond just, uh, you know, like uh, somehow, sometimes I think that we keep repeating the stories that happened 30 years ago, but if, if they are still relevant now, and if you use the same vocabulary, it won't just work. Matthias? Very good question. I'm thinking of a good example, but um, I just remember that maybe it's not so much related to your question, that I, I was actually, um, the first time I, was doing some, I created some format with some students some time ago. It was actually, it's actually more than, I think almost 20 years ago, uh, or something like that, I think maybe 18 years, where, uh, which was called Darknet Safaris. So we went through, um, like uh, I was showing the students, they, they got like some, some, some specific tasks and um, they would actually surf the dark web and then try to, like in a safari, um, do screenshots on specific pages and then actually see uh, what they have found and had to discuss it. And uh, what I found interesting in this context is like nobody was thinking that this is actually, like nobody took a lot of these things serious because for example, if you remember um, one of the most popular websites um, that were also in the beginning uh, Bitcoin related were these kind of hitman uh, sites on the dark web where you could actually hire a hitman, like one 
a Bitcoin and, and no questions asked and so on. And th this became a meme to some extent that everyone had this, uh, every of these sites had the, same, had the same text. So what I found interesting though at this time was that um, all of the students and nobody was really scared to surf the dark web. And I can see a tendency these days that people start to um, being afraid of even starting Tor and doing some shenanigans with it. And the reason is, in my opinion, the anonymity set. So for example, if we have not enough people that are using Tor in a, in a country, like um, a country where I'm from, uh, Austria, it's, it's really so little uh, people using it, it becomes actually a problem. You're, you're becoming um, actually targetable by the amount of, um, by, by the type of data, by the, by the fingerprint of data that you're creating. So we have to actually counter that by somehow teaching also people that um, they shouldn't be scared about um, privacy or private technologies. I feel that's the biggest issue we have these days, that people feel like, okay, they're doing something wrong if they're using some encrypted communication. I think this is something that's important to me to counter. So I have tried and failed to advocate for a number of <laughs> important technologies over the years, um, especially like the first few years I was in Bitcoin. Um, I was you know, telling everybody I knew, like, you should check out this alternative money because your current money is going to get debased and yada, yada, yada. And you know, that argument fell flat on people's ears because I was preaching to people living in the United States who were not experiencing the pain. Um, so I think it's, it's one thing when you're, you have to know your audience. It's one thing like if you're in a country where people are experiencing the pain of, for example, an authoritarian regime that is actively hunting them and threatening them. In those cases, I think that you can sell security and privacy because they can see the threat right in front of them. But me being in America, the threat is much more abstract. I, I'm sure a lot of people would disagree uh, because we think about these threats a lot more and we understand that they're real. But to the average person, it's far too abstract to try to pitch security, to try to pitch privacy. So uh, you know, what I've found is that it's more important to know what your audience's pain points are. So for example, if I, I tell people you know, what you should do is you should uh, install these ad blocker extensions or you should use Brave Browser because it has a lot of ad blocking built in. And they're like, why should I do that? Well, don't you find those ads really annoying? <laughs> and and, and your, your page will load faster because it's not <laughs> loading all these ads. So you know, that is an incentive that people might actually care about. Um, you know, on the, the flip side of security things, it's, uh, it's even more difficult if someone is not being actively attacked in some way. But I, I see you know, both privacy and security as being flip sides of the same coin, so sometimes you can start to edge people over into understanding that it's all actually related. Um, it, and it's just really a matter of talking to the person to understand what their incentives and their pain points are. Uh, if, if I go out and preach stuff based on what's going on in my head, <laughs> it's going to fall flat on most people's ears. Jared? Yeah, 100%. Like, I mean, every time I've done any direct advocacy, uh, it has, hasn't really worked, right? But the times it has worked is through need. And I think, like, the first time I really saw that working uh, was when uh, some friends of mine wanted to use the Silk Road, right? Uh, and then they became a lot more interested in these ideas uh, as a consequence of... Uh, the utility that Silk Road was providing them at the time. Um, the thing that probably stands out most in terms of the, the experiences I could probably relate to me was just um, someone had sent me a link to uh, a poll thread on 4chan, uh, which had a status general during COVID. Um, and it had a link there to a status uh, uh, open chat, uh, which was just a pub sub topic where people were coordinating uh, their protests against uh, the COVID restrictions in Australia, which is something that I hold quite dear to me being Australian. So it was just amazing to see that something that I created actually had some utility in, in the real world, right? Um, and it comes down to this, like, this real need of like, when this actually matters. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, look at WhatsApp. My understanding is that WhatsApp became incredibly popular because SMS in yep. a lot of third world countries was just way too expensive. And now you could, you could get the same functionality and you're using the data instead of the SMS. Uh, and basically, 
tricked people into having stronger privacy. So I think in a lot of cases, <laughs> you need to offer some other incentive and, and just kind of shove the privacy and the security under the hood. Yeah. Five cents about WhatsApp, because it has been developed in Ukraine, and at that time, even there were sort of political turmoil, but sort of normal, like communist versus some shady oligarch and stuff. There was no advanced encryption at that time because people were just chasing capitalism. Like, let's make more money, let's build a unicorn, the next one or the next one or the next one. And, but with a fairly small team, which is super great for engineering purposes, uh, they sold out. And then it's interesting that the whole security side came later uh, from the States. Uh, maybe someone from the regional team played an important role, but by default, so that there was no this dev consciousness embedded in the game. I was also interested that 2017, there was this thing of uh, public chains versus private chains, and it was sort of a joke, like, huh, private chains, it's IBM game, Hyperledger stuff, it's, it's a joke, everything should be transparent. But this year I met Wasabi guys in, on Pizza Day uh, in Prague, and they said, like, sometimes we think that Bitcoin is just transparent for a reason. Uh, in that sense. And uh, even today, there was talk on privacy that many people who at first encountered Bitcoin, they were thinking, wow, this is for privacy, for anonymity, ultimate greatest tool. Why? And also, I know that many people from CCC were sort of rejecting crypto in a bigger sense. Why this mental misconception of Bitcoin happened in, within the wider public that it's sort of private, anonymous transactions? I think because definitely there was some miscommunication happening at some stage that um, Bitcoin is entirely uh, private and people started to catch up on that. Um, although, um, as uh, Francisco Arctigman uh, really nicely put uh, in a talk that he presented during MoneroCon, um, it was not intended for us to throw around our public keys and, and make it available to everyone. So we are, in a way, also feeding the, the dragon like that, so um, I find this always a bit challenging um, because I see this a lot in, 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 in marketing activities that people, um, especially on, on X, I'm quite sure you've seen this as well, like um, um, drop your wallet uh, here to <laughs> get some, some airdrops or something like that. <laughs> so that's, that's insane. The, the, as these are the practices we need to somehow change, in my opinion. Yeah, well, A, I think Almost nobody knows the difference between pseudonymous and anonymous. Mm. And B, I would argue that in the early days, it was anonymous. And that uh, Bitcoin could still be anonymous if not for the fact that we created all of these centralized providers that were doing AML KYC. Mm. If, if Bitcoin had remained a purely peer-to-peer -peer system where we were just directly interacting with each other, it would be much harder for, uh, you know, analysis entities to go through and dox wide swaths of Bitcoin users, because there would just be a lot more you know, doors to kick down, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, they basically said what I was going to say. Um, certainly the pseudonymity aspect um, was it. I, I guess like one thing that comes to mind, given uh, your talk on values, is that uh, Bitcoin could also be seen associated with like the cypherpunk movement. And so there may be even the cultural propagation around uh, the cypherpunks being associated with Bitcoin might bleed off in a similar way that Telegram is considered to be a private messenger, um, where it clearly isn't. Well, it partially can uh, make an argument. It I will connect two things right now. Uh, you made a talk on Honey Badger years ago and this kind of like hardcore privacy, which is like even that obfuscate your um, the car plate and stuff like hardcore ones that majority of people just don't do at all because they think sometimes that privacy is just one app, let's say, private messenger, and that's it, that's the privacy. While uh, you are proposing the whole stack of technologies from sort of like one big umbrella that proposing different privacy opportunities from the messaging protocols to the pr private storage and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, how you would sort of like navigate the privacy stack uh, on-chain, off-chain, uh, is like healthy balance for the general public. For the, because your talk was about, we should bring these values to society, which means not just by one individual who is hyper-protected, but everyone else failed to. Like how you are choosing which tools 
and off-chain and on-chain to combine, and also the, so maybe lifestyle choices? Yeah, okay, that's a big question. Um, I, I guess uh, I'd counter that, like, um, for me, what's concerning about, say, public blockchains or, public, you know, uh, today is, you know, the sort of attacks or new attacks that we're starting to see from state-level adversaries, right? Um, and so, for me, it's a matter of, like, how can we strengthen these uh, these protocols and, uh, and the implementations of these protocols um, in such a way that they become more resistant to the, the, those kinds of attacks, right? Uh, and then, by extension of doing that, um, uh, I mean, I also view blockchains as like these Lamportian part-time parliaments, right? Um, but that's because I have a very specific application of them. Uh, but that that's completely separated from like the lifestyle aspect of that. And, and um, again, like you want to find some kind of utility where you, uh, as Jameson said, like you shove the, you know, you kind of sneak this sort of stuff in the back uh, back end, right? So. For me, it's like, okay, how can we actually create like parallel societies or um, parallel institutions? Um, and for me, that's like through creating uh, community organization uh, development, uh, like local neighborhood communities, like circular economies and so on. Um, and it just so happens that that um, completely separate parallel organization just happens to use this technology. Um, and I think that's where you, that way you can build out a volunteer group that doesn't have to be so dialed in to how the technology works, um, but you can also use that as a way of generating shared narratives um, that lends legitimacy um, to these privacy protocols while getting away from like the, the darkness or like the scary vibes that uh, privacy offers conjures in people's minds. I don't know if that's the answer to your question, but that's how I'm thinking about it. I know, I like the circular economy aspect because it kind of relates to what I was saying with the centralized AML KYC providers is that uh, I think one of the most effective ways to improve people's privacy is stop telling people to buy cryptocurrency. Uh, <laughs> you should earn cryptocurrency. Mm. You should be selling your goods and services for cryptocurrency. And that's, that's how we create the alternative economy. Absolutely. Yeah, when I add to that, um, I think like one way how to tackle that is also to get out of our comfort zone because I feel like there's always this debate um, and I try to also make this point uh, in my talk. Um, there's this old um, saying like uh, you can either choose a convenient system and, uh, but it won't be that private, it won't be that secure or you can choose uh, a convenience. And I think that the, the, the problem is not that statement because that's definitely true. That's what all the software is that is out there. But um, personally, my own experience and how I learned to use computers and use technology is by using them the hard way. So learning the hard way, mm -hmm. opening up things, understanding what's going on. And the problem I feel is like this is getting harder and even really to the extent that I would say I need some formal education or more information than I would actually... Uh, get these days in, in, in school or so, so we have to really rethink this and also maybe define and create new educational formats. Um, open source hardware is one aspect of that, or open source culture can help uh, help us with that, but of course it's just the first step, because in my opinion also open source culture gets commodified, becomes some kind of marketplace for, for developers, so we have to constantly fight battles on different sides of the war, <laughs> but in some to some extent I think it starts with not becoming too convenient with the technologies around us and questioning every single bit of it. And there's even a notion that uh, hackers' word has been hijacked by just funny developers who are not hackers at all. Um, and we've seen uh, a lot of those. So uh, as you know, WikiLeaks has been really supported by Bitcoin. It was in the center uh, of the self-funding, let's say, mechanisms. And we were talking about Michael about that, where is the next Snowden? And if you would see leaks around the world, they're happening within The Guardian when people are leaking directly to journalists, to civic journalists, and sort of like maybe even there's no need of like of that uh, service or, or the open source, no, no, like anonymous organization in that sense, because they should move somewhere else in sense of invent a new new tooling. But in this new tooling, there's a big challenge how to collaborate with traditional institutions, organizations, because they're hyper-skeptical towards crypto. I, even the fellow hackers are skeptical towards crypto. How you build the bridges within the skeptics, or the one who never 
I don't know, experienced crypto? Well, it's a very good question. Um, I think only by showing true use cases that matter to people. Which one you're showing? So, uh, I mean, me personally, I'm, I'm failing often to, to, to excite people about crypto that uh, um, I would say the Bitcoin or, or blockchain part of crypto. So, um, in my experience, like other, like really, like secure communication or these type of things are much more tangible to a lot mm -hmm. of people that are not so much, that don't buy the complete uh, crypto stuff. Um, yeah, so it's, I guess, like we need um, some very, very simple and low-hanging fruits to show. I'm, I'm, I'm also struggling to, to identify those now. Jameson? It's tough. There's a lot of haters, uh, you know, especially in the cybersecurity community, kind of as you've alluded to. Uh, a lot of people inject their politics into it, and, and I, I've seen... I think a large swath of the cybersecurity community is very anti-Bitcoin uh, due to ESG narratives and, and you know, a lot of the, the standard arguments against like why it's terrible. Um, so I don't know. I, I, don't even, I don't even try to uh, <laughs> convince the haters anymore. Kind of like, like I said before, um, the, the easiest way is to, to find the people who actually need it the most. And I think that that's just gonna happen organically. And um, I'm always amazed by seeing what all of the many advocates who are going out there across the world and finding new use cases and ways that uh, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, cryptographic protocols can completely change people's lives and, and especially people's lives who are nothing like mine who I couldn't even have envisioned uh, you know, have certain problem sets. Oh, just quick five cents here. The why Zcash Foundation once has been interested in in like tweet that I made because just by drinking beer with the Russian guy in Barcelona, he told me that he sent uh, shielded Zcash to his friends in Ukraine so they could buy a SUV for a territorial defense forces. Uh, it's just simple, like 2K or whatever. And Zcash was like, oh. Such use cases exist. We want to know more because they're practical and there's sort of um, embedded emotional uh, story behind it. Exactly. Uh, unfortunately, bad things have to happen in order for people to realize the utility of these protocols. Mm. Um, I haven't read, like, gotten too much opposition except for like one strong one that comes out uh, comes to mind. Um, so I had a side project working on the Wayland compositor for Linux to extend it for mix, mixed reality. Um, so you'd have like 3D applications running in the compositor. Uh, and we we're working with a very prominent uh, open source developer in that field. Uh, he was strongly against with even working with us, or me, with me, because we were a crypto company, right? Um, and it took a, like, a long time for him to kind of start seeing that there was a humanitarian um, and social aspect to this, or um, like my worldview around that, because like for his perspective, um, there's like this sort of screen of like scammers, and you know, like if you're outside of the field, you know, you you see a lot of these like uh, digital asset types or centralized exchange sort of uh, nefarious action going on. So there's that kind of buffer between the core of the community and like the, the periphery that I think that needs to, uh, I don't know how to solve that, but uh, mm -hmm. it exists, yeah. Um, since we are running a bit out of time, I would like at the end focus on the tooling and practical advices. But one thing first to the previous speaker, that there's a collective in Berlin working on reproducible build uh, called uh, Poetic Technologies. They wrote TE manifesto, they want to propel TE, create source of consortium so people would exchange knowledge. And right now there are lots of name dropping around, uh, GKP, fully homomorphic encryption, TE, MPC, and everyone is uh, dropping these things into the air, I guess in many cases to raise more money. Um, but uh, what are the practical technologies uh, that you sort of want to see developed or implemented in the future and or the tooling that uh, appeared the rec recent years that you are having big hope in terms of privacy enhancing or anonymity empowerment? Um, I think, uh, if I might start, um, I think like we need to really fix first that a lot of the open source projects are maintained thanklessly, 
sometimes out of Nebraska, but also sometimes out of other places. This is really a problem. So most of, our, of the software out there we are using to secure our organizations, people we love, and so on, is, are run by and are maintained by people who are not really getting well paid. I think this is something mm. that we need to fix first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I honestly think that most of the internet could use re-architecting. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, especially any, any of the extremely popular services out there that effectively are operating as data warehouses, you know, especially like the, the major social media companies. Um, almost, almost any free service that's out there uh, because basically pe what people are paying for is they're paying with their data. Um, so, you know, there's a variety of, you know, social networking protocols that are being worked on underway. Um, and also that, that may hopefully eventually get us to a point where we actually come to a solution for digital identity, uh, whatever that is, because, you know, the dystopian future is that digital identity is a state-sanctioned identity. Whereas, uh, you know, cypherpunks, I believe, would say that it should really be some sort of cryptographic self-attestation or web of trust at attestation. Um, and I, I, th I see that uh, digital identity as being a big missing piece of the puzzle to re-architecting a lot of the other uh, internet-based services that we're using. Especially in Logos. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess, like, one way to view the privacy is like you know it, it enables more freedom or more so, you know self sovereignty, um, and on that front, like I, I would actually probably move away from like protocols in terms of what I would want to see and more towards like open hardware, right? Both specifically in terms of like um, compute uh, for consumers, uh, but also in terms of networking, like um, you know better availability for. Uh, ad hoc Wi-Fi, peer-to-peer mesh nets or something that we really good to see uh, for local communities, but yeah. Ma Michael, do we have two minutes? Ah, perfect. Then I would ask you to, so in our work we found out that people don't know how to do research if a project is private or not, um, but it's important to test new tools at the same time, especially for sort of knowing what's happening, testing UX UI, the same way that you were testing status with me several days ago. Um, what kind of several new tools that appeared recently you would recommend people to, to test and explore uh, apart from, the, you know, like the tools everyone knows, the, f the fresh ones? It could be hardware in, in your case. Oh, good question. Like what, what, to ex what to suggest to people to explore? Uh, it, it's in sync with your playful education mode when you're saying, okay, you're not in the game, just try it. Just play with it. Yeah. Personally, I think people should look. I, I, liked, uh, I like to also respond to, to what you said about open hardware. I think it's like really easy to get into tinkering with hardware these days. And this is partially because like, um, there's a lot of, it's a market out there. So people st start to um, play with um, Raspberry Pi. Unfortunately, it's not the op most open of systems. So I'm not a huge fan of it, but it did a lot into education of, uh, of people, and it's, it's, it's great to see that stuff like this exists. But this is a big problem that I see and a big hurdle for people to get started with hardware, that if you want to run embedded Linux, you are basically, you have to learn a lot of things before, before you can really build your own systems. But open hardware and, and these type of things, I think, I think a good starting point because it gets you back to the roots of all sorts of things, of cryptography, of like, the normal processes of, or the interaction or like other things, smart devices, for example. Um, this is also usually a security nightmare, but if you start to understand like what, what can be interesting there, for example, to build up um, an, a different communication network based on LoRa or some other, um, on, on some other technology that's, that's interesting, that's maybe a bit too much to ask of a lot of people to start with, but <laughs> maybe. Open hardware is the best. Their own names, like brands or websites? About LoRa technology? No, 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 just in general for open hardware, where people I mean, can play around. Right now, there's the Open Source Hardware Month. So the uh, OSHWA, the Open Source Hardware Association, is um, organizing a lot of events around that. You can tap into that. It's um, at the OSH, Open uh, Hardware Month, dot uh, .org. Um, you can find it online. There's a lot of like, educational material there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, for me, I would focus on 
the low-hanging fruit in terms of usability. Uh, usability is what we focus on at Casa. Like, even though our fundamental thing is offering super high security, the way that we do that is try to make it a as easy as possible, you know, like uh, iPhone, iOS style uh, UX. And so the, the basic things that I would suggest that people try out would be operating system. Uh, try out Linux, not any Linux, but something like Popos. Uh, that's it's like a very user-friendly version of Linux that's also quite secure and private. Um, stop using Google services. Use Proton-based services. Um, they're just as easy to use, uh, but will get you a better level of privacy and security. If you want to go a little further down the rabbit hole, try out a completely different phone architecture. Um, I've been um, using graphene for a number of years, and it has greatly improved. It's like it no longer requires like command line usage to install on on a, a Pixel phone anymore. It, it's literally just USB plug into your browser, um, and there's a lot of improved you know tooling around it. So it's it's actually fairly easy to use as a daily driver. So you know there are there are now you know, completely parallel alternative systems that you can use as a basis for your digital life that are about as user-friendly as the mainstream stuff, and it's worth checking out. Mm. Yeah, I guess once you've done Popos, you know, try and try, uh, try out cubes and see how you have to I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I also covered it for, for most people. I, for, for me, uh, I'm lagging behind on like the latest developments on MPC and like the homomorphic encryption. So I'd like to take the sabbatical and play around with that, uh, some of the advancements there, uh, and catch up to speed. Um, but yeah, that's what I would like to play with. Uh, what helped with the Graphene is that uh, once I installed it and put it publicly, many people came and recommended lots of applications. Uh, I, and I found it super helpful that random people were saying that's an alternative for Pocket, alternative for VLC, or no, VLC players there, but for like a, a YouTube client and stuff like that. That was super helpful, but I hope that people will stay that helpful and not will fall into the paranoid uh, boogeyman conversations because they're not that helpful. Uh, thanks, Ma Michael, for giving time. Thanks, uh, speakers, for joining the panel. And I hope that everyone enjoyed the homey feeling of the whole two days of POV Summit. Thank, thank you.